All right. Well, now you're good and warmed up. Jeb and I are going to go on the road. Jeb and Steve's actually adventure. Trying to convince white people that y'all need to get your schools right. <laughs> really is the truth, though, right? Because the Titanic is sunk. Started down, 1912, went down. This beautiful, forward-thinking vessel went down. And the reason it went down is not because it hit an iceberg, but because it did not heed the six warnings of ice the day before. Six warnings. Six different times somebody said, yo, you might want to look out for the ice up here around Alaska. It's cold. There's likely to be ice. It might hit us. Six different times the captain was warned. You keep going the way you're going, this could be bad. Now, we have these kind of conversations with our kids. I'm an educator, but really, I'm a father. And what that means is I have people in my house who every single day challenge the fact that I'm an educator. In fact, my youngest son's very purpose in life is to prove that I'm not nearly as good as people say. <laughs> this dude wakes up in the morning to make sure he proves that you're really not that good at educating people. When we're warning a child, we call that parenting. When we warn grown people, I just call it aggravating. Because to say the same thing over and over again to adults, in many cases, some of the most powerful people in the state, to try to get them to understand that, listen, you in Michigan are losing for real. If you heard anything, Jeb said, Governor Bush said something really, really powerful. He said that if the poor children, if the poor children in Florida were a state, they would beat you. You mean you. Not just the poor minority children in Pontiac, not just the poor minority kids in Detroit. You is you. You is the group of people that are often overlooking the obvious because for so long you've fallen into this bucolic haze. Yeah, it's bad, but it's not that bad for me. No, it is. It really, it really is. I asked the folks here before bringing me, I asked them if they could take a look at the school districts that most often send young people to prison. They can look at the performance of those school districts. We often hear the school to prison pipeline, and no one really knows what it is. We hear it as this thing. We talk about it. And it's no surprise. Only 11% of the eighth graders in those communities, there are only 25, 25 school districts in the state of Michigan that send the majority of children or people to prison. 25, 25. 11% of them are reading that grade level in the eighth grade, 11% of the kids in those. You think, wow, that's terrible. Well, it's worse than terrible. It's worse than terrible. You meet a young lady, you think she's beautiful, you want to marry her, so you drop down on one knee and you ask her to marry you, and she has an 89% chance of cheating on you. You are not continuing with the question. You want to recount. We ain't talking about no dangling chads here. We often overlook this because we say that's other people's kids. And so as a result of that, you know, certain communities, that's where they live. That's just what it is. And as a result, that's what we expect. In fact, if you continue all the way forward, you see that only 68% of the kids from those school systems graduate. And of the 68% that graduate, 13% can do math on grade level. 31% can do math can read on grade level. Now, we have this conversation about reading on grade level very often. And we think, well, what does that really mean? What it means is if you can't read on grade level up through high school, these young people could not read a Google article. They could not go on Yahoo News and read it. 
not just would they miss the words, they wouldn't be able to tell you back what it said. They wouldn't be able to compute what it is. Now, I know some of us are not terribly comfortable with math, but when only 13% of the children who received a high school diploma in these lowest performing school districts, the ones that are most likely to send kids to prison, only 13% of those who graduated, of the 68%, can't do math on grade level, that means that they can't add fractions. That means that they couldn't tell you what the half of a pizza looks like. Some of you are small businesswomen and men. Some of you are pretty large businessmen, like gigantic business people. <laughs> Who's going to employ them but a local drug dealer or thug? But we expect that because that's other people's kids. Well, while 80% of the children in, in Michigan are said to graduate, while 80% are said to graduate, only 37% of Michigan's children, 37% of the other groups, are doing math on grade level. If you didn't vote yes for the A to F system, let me help you. Y'all got an F in math. <laughs> but wait. While 37% of those children from the lowest performing school systems, the ones that are most likely to send their children to prison, while 37% of them, I mean 31% of them are reading at grade level, only 60% of the rest of your kids are. Upon graduation from high school. One of the hardest parts of this experience for me and it really is a trippy experience for me because growing up in public housing, born on my mother's 16th birthday, third generation of poverty, there are certain groups that I was expecting to be speaking to in my journey to encourage people to open up the conversation around education. This is not one of them. I did not expect that I would have to convince you of all people that getting a D is not cool. Getting a D as a state is no bueno. That in fact, you can do better. That their children, poor children in Florida who are outperforming your middle class children in Michigan, in school. Remember they told us that the issue was if they were poor, they couldn't learn. Well, apparently if you put some sun on them, they do really, really well. At what point does pride kick in? At what point do you as a state say, enough is a damn enough? At what point do you stop trying to tiptoe around the teachers union? Let me tell you, they are your problem. See, other people don't want to say that because they don't want you to say something. Because now you're talking bad about teachers. I ain't talking bad about teachers. I'm talking about the teachers union. Teachers union is not the teachers. They're not the rank and file. But let's be clear, some of them are terrible too. Just because someone decided to be a teacher or an administrator doesn't make them a good person. What makes them a good person may mean the way that they conduct themselves among their family or church community, but doesn't make them a good teacher. What makes them a good teacher is the objective truth. The objective truth is a teacher teaches. See, there's some things that are named what they do. Sometimes when I observe some of the teachers in our schools, they say, but I taught it. Well, apparently you're the only one who learned it. You said it. That is true. Out loud, you said it. And you definitely know how to do it. But I'm not paying you to perform math. I'm paying you to teach math. See, the problem that we're faced with is not whether or not the minority children and, and parents are understanding that they need school choice. It's if you do. See, what we need to have is an honest conversation about real school choice. I am a pro-voucher guy. I keep it simple. Real simple. I think every single child should be given access to a voucher. And that voucher should be used to go to whatever kind of school they want, period. Because we allow them to do that when it comes to college. You can take a Pell Grant to BYU. You can take a Pell Grant to Notre Dame or any Catholic school you wish. You can take the historically black college, you can take the, a women's college or a men's college, and no one says a thing. The reason why no one says a thing is because there's no threat 
to the very system that employs people. That's the point. The teachers union's very purpose is to make sure that people keep a job. They're fighting for jobs while we're fighting for our future. Your school systems are perfectly designed to produce what they do, which is employed people. Awesome. Way to go. Thumbs up for all of you. But it's not producing educated children, which is a problem, really. So you don't have to necessarily be an educator to understand that if only 60% of your children who are graduating from high school, folks, we're only counting the graduates. Those other kids don't go away. They don't just evaporate. You just don't hit them on the head and boof, they go. They're still people. 75% of the young people who were found in prison cannot read, period. Wonder where they came from. Wonder how they got there. And I wonder who they hurt along the way. See, what my job here today is to do is to point out to you the obvious. That you have to use your political heft and you have to push it until the problem goes away. Every single child in this state has the capacity to do something wonderful. Listen, I've had the great fortune of meeting people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And when I grew up poor, I thought that if you were wealthy, you were smart. Well, I was told that if you went to a private school, you were definitely smarter than the rest of us. Just means you can pay for it. There's talent all over this great state. There are beautiful, powerful children in some of the most unassuming places. Children who just want to make a difference. And then there are children in other spaces, some of the most auspicious spaces, and they too are talented. But the fact is, when we set the expectations low, we keep getting these Fs. We, in this state and in this country, are more focused on the concerns of the people who are called teachers than we are on the people that are supposed to be teaching. Teaching is hard. It ain't that damn hard. It's not. I run schools in Bridgeport, Connecticut, Harlem, New York, and soon to open in the Bronx. I promise you, we're good. It ain't that hard. Not hard like impossible. See, what they want you to believe is that you keep putting too many expectations on them. Too many tests. Teach it to the test. Listen, homie, if you would teach it to the test, you'd be doing better on the test. <laughs> Who teaches to the test and keeps failing it? Maybe you suck as a teacher. You can't always blame somebody else for your folly. Sometimes you got to get better at your job. And you have an obligation as a business community, but more importantly as parents, to expect more from your schools. This is not okay. As beautiful a building as it is, and it really is well done, man. I think you've got a future in this hotel stuff. You should keep it up. As beautiful as this building is and as cool as your art walk is, at the end of the day, people want to live in places that are safer. And places that are safer are typically the places with the best schools. Shocker. Smart people don't like robbing people. Strange statistic, but true. And you can make more smart people when you create more compelling schools. And the way to create more compelling schools is not to put them in the hands of school districts or boards of education. I know some of y'all are on the board of education. With all due respect, most of you have no idea how to run a school. But you know who does? Parents. We as parents know what we want from a school when we go there. As soon as we walk in the building, we either like it or we don't. And there's something about it that, we, that moves us. And every single one of us, while we may not understand the metrics that are used to, to determine whether or not the school is successful, we do, however, know what a good school looks like. You know who else knows what a good school looks like? The teachers who work in them. Isn't it always interesting that some of the lowest performing schools have the least amount of teachers who send their kids to those schools? Hmm. Imagine, if you will, every single person who worked in a school had to send their kid to that school. What? Some schools would stop sucking real fast. But that's not what's happening here. What happens here is we play this silly game where the teachers union in particular makes you feel guilty. Now, I did not grow up as a wealthy white dude. Shocker. 
But had I, you'd have to work pretty damn hard to make me feel guilty about it. Why am I going to apologize for being successful? That is not a problem. What they want to do is they want to ostracize you and make you feel like you do not have a right to participate in the conversation. Because for some twist of fate, because you're doing better than other people, that for whatever reason, you can't have a conversation about education. When in fact, many of you, hopefully, pay more taxes towards this very system. So why shouldn't you expect more from it? Why are you okay with a statewide D and F? You put more pressure on your high school football coaches than you do the school itself. I don't care how much you like this guy, but if he loses 89% of his games, he's a former high school coach. But when we do it with children, when only 11% of the kids can do math, folks, it's math. It's not that deep, says the father who spent three and a half hours on Sunday with his 13-year-old who was focused on proving that he's not a good educator. Doing math. It is not impossible. And if you want proof of that, look at many of the charter schools that are out there that are educating almost exclusively poor minority students that are outperforming your suburban schools. How about that? How about that for an irony? See, one of the reasons why the Titanic was such a tragedy is not because it was hit. Because it was actually designed to have four of its halls open, four of its sections open. But in that case, five were open. That's not why it sunk. That's why it sunk, but that's not why everybody died. Everyone died because of the system that surrounded it. The lifeboats were designed so that they would take people off the boat, bring them to shore, go back out. These mugs just left. They put the people on the boat and did not come back. This system that we have is not designed to make sure that all children can learn. It's designed to make sure that all of the adults in it keep their jobs. And it is amazing at it. It is stunning. You have school districts in which they have a 97% return rate and a 6% pass rate in math. Whoa. Everybody's good at their job, but the kids are bad at learning? All of them? Wow. Do you understand the kids could have stayed home and 6% of them could have become proficient at math? Stayed home with no one. They could have stayed home and 13% of them could have learned to read on grade level. But that's not what we're doing. Here in Michigan, you just keep spending more money, more money, 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 because they say the teachers are not paid enough. And you need to pay them more because teaching is a hard job. Yeah, cool. Pay me more. I'll take it. But you have the right to expect more. Imagine, if you will, the person who cuts your lawn says, damn, I will keep cutting it, but it just keeps growing. Every time I cut it, it grows. You got to pay me more because this grass just keeps growing. You know, kids these days, they're kids, man. Look, middle school girls are the meanest people on earth. Always going to be. <laughs> I have no understanding, but they are, whoo, wait, they just, you're like, what the hell is wrong with you? It's 630. How are you? This mad at 6.30 a.m. And boys are never going to know where anything is. That's what they got a mother for. Ma, where are my legs? <laughs> Honey, they're at the bottom of your torso. No, they're not. We understand that this is what we signed up for. But you, as the business community, our friends and families, you keep letting us off the hook. We make you feel bad. We make you feel guilty. Tell you you want to privatize education. So 
What if you did? Most of you don't, because really, there's no money to be made in it. Trust me on this one. The margins suck. It just costs too much. But here's the fact. The fact is that you have an obligation as a community to push back and to stop allowing yourselves to be painted into an intellectual ghetto where someone just says, you don't understand. This is a hard job. And you guys are like, all right, whatever. I was going to contribute and I'm just good. Because when the overwhelming majority of your community's children, black, white, Latino, Asian, poor and wealthy, cannot perform on grade level, that's bad. It's bad for business. It's really bad for business. Forget the family piece of it. It's bad. There are not a lot of companies that are coming around saying, you know what I want to do? I want to move my company to a place where people can't read. Sure can't wait for that one. Where the home values go down quickly. Ooh, sounds fun. Throwing those cold Michigan winters and you got a winner. <laughs> the truth is that we're at a place now where we have to recognize that you've been warned now more than six times. That there's ice in this water. And if being 44th is not a wake up call. If Governor Jeb Bush, who should have been our president. It's true. If he can tell you how he moved some student populations six hundred and fifty percent. And I don't know what else to tell you. You have the answers in this room. You have some of those powerful people in the state right here, right now. And you know it. You guys seen each other's houses. You're doing well. <laughs> You've priced out how much that bed costs. You're like, wow, that's a really pricey bed. If failure doesn't move you, then success has to. Imagine, if you will, if you've done as well as you've done with your schools performing this poorly, what happens when they start to perform well? What happens when children are excited about going to school and you don't have to worry about chronic truancy and you don't have to create schools that look more like prisons than they do schools? What happens when you stop hiring more security officers and police officers in schools and you can start hiring social workers and AP class teachers? What happens then? What happens when you're not patting kids down to go into the ninth grade on a Monday? What happens? What changes? You as a community become the place where people come to. You become more and more competitive. And this becomes a happier community. Not happy in the ethereal just passing, but genuinely happier and safer. Last week I was here in Detroit, actually, here in Michigan. And I will be back again on Friday in Detroit. And I was speaking to some schools that are some of the lowest performing schools in this state. And I said to them, you need a new normal, man. What you see every day, that ain't normal. Kids afraid to go to the bathroom because they think somebody's going to jump them. Teachers who just sit back, cross their arms and don't teach. That's not normal. In any community. Again, it's so easy for us to think of it and to create a distance when it's someone else's kids. When only 60% of your children in this state graduate from high school reading at grade level, that's significant. And that's got to frighten you. When only 37% can do math on grade level, that's got to scare you. Because what happens when they become parents? I get it, the whole gender reveal party, you know, you got to throw the ball up in here, it's got to turn pink or blue. I get it. I get it. Over-celebrated generation that comes behind them. Look, I'm not a fan of the millennials either. In fact, if some of y'all are in here, I don't really like you. <laughs> Never have. You guys are just a lot. Way too, I'm sorry, I fell into that. So, 
This group here has to fight for universal vouchers. The reason why is because never should a child be on a waiting list. In our schools, we have waiting lists of 1,000 and 1,500 kids. Why am I waiting? Because I run a charter school now, and as a charter school, they only allow me the certain number of seats that they determined a while ago. So those children just languish. They just sit there on a waiting list. And then they do it again. They apply the next year. They're not getting in. We're only accepting 100 kids. I don't care what your party is, and I genuinely mean this. And I don't care what your politics are. But we're all Americans, man. But more importantly, most of us here are parents. And there's nothing just about having to win a lottery to just go to school. And so I submit to you today, let's make this change. Let's decide that we're going to remain, remain resolute, that we're going to fight the consistent lies of the teachers union that will have you believe in that our children simply can't be taught at the same time that they try to accuse you of being racist. They're saying the most racist thing that you could ever say. Isn't that interesting? They're accusing you of something that they're actually doing so that they can protect themselves. You're over-testing us. No, they, the kids are stressed. No, they're not really stressed. They just take the test. It doesn't really matter to them. It matters to the teachers and the union because it shows that what they said is a lie. You have to remain, re remain resolute. You have to support candidates who are willing to fight. And you have to support organizations from different communities, like the minority community. They're going to work with you. More than you realize, there are people on what would appear to be the furthest left, minority and poor parents, who want the exact same thing that you do, freedom. Plain, simple freedom. The freedom to know that they're going to send their child to the very best school. And the same prayer that you pray each night that your children do better than you did, the same hope that you go into every single day with is the same hope that they have. We can change this. The people in this room can change this. And we know how. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. So I had a couple minutes to answer a couple questions. Um, all right. Yes, over here. I'll repeat the question. What are the goals of the environmental community service university staff that are welcoming our new candidates? What are we doing for our gubernatorial candidates? Do not have an educational platform, and how can we force that to happen now? No disrespect to many politicians, especially the president and company, but politicians tend to take on the platform that we say they're supposed to. And so you guys are here. I, I want to make this point, and I do really, I, I joke a lot about this, but I am both surprised and saddened when I feel like I'm in front of a group that is as powerful as this one. Um, and we're still asking some of these questions. You know, they train an, an elephant. They tell you how to train an elephant. They first put a, a, they used to put a big heavy ball on its leg, right, with a big uh, iron cuff on its foot, and the elephant wouldn't be able to move it from when it was really little. But over time, the man who's training the elephant couldn't carry the ball. But the elephant over time stops trying to pull his leg because he sees the cuff there. There's a lot of pachyderms in this room. We have to recognize that we don't have to ask anybody for anything. You can demand it. You can tell them that this is the platform that we seek. 
The reason why I push for vouchers, which among even the charter groups is the third rail, not even up for discussion, is because I understand the game. They can negotiate back from that. I'm not going to negotiate until we get there. And the reason why I push for vouchers is, is the reason they, they push against it. Because vouchers and charters are the real threat to the existence of the traditional teachers union. The majority of teachers who are in the union are in the traditional neighborhood schools. And as such, every single time we pull 20 kids out or 20 kids decide to go to a different school, they see that as the loss of one staff member because it's typically a one to 20 ratio. So they do not want parents to make their own decisions. In fact, you'll hear them say what I believe is an inherently racist statement. They used to say this, especially at the beginning, and they're supposed to be liberals. They would say, well, the parents wouldn't even know what schools to choose. Wow. That's a lot of entitlement coming out of that statement, but you do. Funny, though, the best schools have the longest waiting lists with some of the most indigent people. Amazing how that happens. The streets talk. So we have to encourage our politicians to represent the people. And more specifically, we have to, in many cases, give them the platform that we believe in. I believe in universal school choice because the system that we currently operate under has been said to be unconstitutional 100 times over. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, and on forward. It just, they just keep saying that. The reason why they keep getting out with these loopholes is because they're saying the separation of church and state. But no one pushes back on them when they say, hey, but wait a minute. How, can I, how come I can take my Pell Grant to, uh, uh, to uh, Boston College, which is a Catholic school or Jesuit school or Georgetown? How can I, how can I do that, but I can't do it in grades K to 12? It's just because we don't push back hard enough. I saw another question. All right, folks, I think you guys have been here a long time and I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Sincerely.